Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are, whenever you may be listening. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number 11. I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge, and I am so happy to be with you. Want to encourage you to check us out on social media. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash talking audiobooks. We are on Twitter at twitter.com slash talking audio. I am Audiobook Casey on Facebook, Twitter, and Goodreads. If you type in Audiobook Casey, all one word, Audiobook C-A-S-E-Y is how you spell it. You can connect with me, and I'm happy to connect with you. If you're a listener to this show, author, narrator, industry professional, whatever the case may be, I'm always happy to connect with you on social media and say hello. I am happy to announce this week that this podcast that you're listening to, Talking Audiobooks, is now available on iHeartRadio. That's right. If you are an iHeartRadio user, you can find us in the app by searching for Talking Audiobooks, and you can listen to the podcast through iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio joins TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and, of course, iTunes as out posts where you can find our show. You can also find us at TalkingAudiobooks.com, and there we have an RSS feed, which you can add to any podcast catcher of your choice manually, and it will deliver each new episode to you. We're happy to make the show available to listeners in as many different ways as we can, so you can hear the show however you want to hear it, and we have an app coming soon that will make it even more easy for you to hear us each and every week. I don't know why I said more easy when I could have said easier, which would have been easier for me to say, but I digress. And so I want you to check us out on any platform of your choice. Hopefully we will have new ones to announce very soon as well, but Uh, We have it all covered for you to the best that we can. And if there's something we're missing, just let us know. Send us an email at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us where you'd like to hear us that we're not, and we will try to make that happen for you. It's time for Talking Audiobooks News. also want to point out a couple things quickly. This is the first podcast in the month of August, so I want to tell you about the fact that the monthly Kindle deals at Amazon have changed. Uh, They've changed out the July books, and you have a new batch to look through in August. And I point this out every month because I know a lot of you are WhisperSync listeners. You like to switch back and forth between reading the Kindle and listening to the audiobook. So we tell you about those WhisperSync deals, and that's a good place to get a discounted Kindle book and a discounted audiobook all in one shot, the monthly Kindle deals on Amazon. We will talk about that more on next week's program. On this week's program, we are going to have an interview with audiobook blogger Felicia Sparks. Felicia, if you saw the Audi Awards, was on stage and helped present some of the categories as the Audiobook Blogger of the Year for 2017 from the Audio Publishers Association. We're going to talk all about how she became the Audiobook Blogger of the Year. We're going to talk about uh, her history with audiobooks, blogging in general. It's a wide-ranging conversation that I had with her. It's going to be a lot of fun for you to hear. It was a very enjoyable conversation for me to have. I have been blessed with a 
a lot of great interviews so far. Uh, guests that are willing to take my question and run with it. I think that makes for the best interview. I've said this before. I will say it often. You hear me every week. So when I have a guest on, I want you to hear them a lot and me a lot less. And I hope I do a good job of that every week. And having guests that are happy to talk about their passion for audiobooks makes a big difference. And so we uh, have been fortunate in the interviews that we've done so far to uh, have guests that are more than happy to talk and share their passion with you because it's also your passion or else you would not be listening to this podcast right now. So that is going to be my interview with Felicia Sparks. She is the geeky blogger. She can be found on her website at geekybloggersbookblog.com. And yes, we do talk about how she came up with that. Uh, you're going to be able to access all of that in the show notes as well. So uh, we're going to have some posts for you to check out and things of that nature from her website. So uh, pay attention to the show notes if you want to find out where you can find all of her good stuff over at her blog. She's the audiobook blogger of the year for a reason, folks. That's one thing that I think you will uh, take away from this interview. Uh, they chose wisely, not that there aren't other bloggers out there that aren't deserving of the award, and that's why it'll be a good thing for the Audio Publishers Association to continue to distribute that award because there are a lot of worthy uh, people out there, but she is definitely one of them, and I'm happy to have her on the show this week. There are so many ways to get free audiobooks this month. Let me tell you about a couple of them. First, if you're not yet a subscriber to audible.com, just go to audibletrial.com forward slash talkie audiobooks and Audible is giving away a free audiobook with a free 30-day trial. No obligation. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks and download your free audiobook along with your first 30 days for free with audible.com. No obligation, no purchase necessary, and you get a free audiobook. How great is that? Well, what's greater than that is, did you know that this month, August, is National Romance Month? Even if you're not in the U.S., which came up with this idea to celebrate romance in the month of August, you can celebrate with us by entering our August Romance Contest to win your choice of four romance audiobooks from audible.com. Or use them for any kind of books you want. Get your choice of audiobooks from any of your favorite romance authors or choose any four books that you'd like. Just enter. Entering is free. Go to our website, TalkingAudiobooks.com, and on the right side, click on the link that says August Contest. Follow the prompt, enter your email, and you're entered. Good to go. Look for a special way to earn extra entries while you're there. So there you have it. A free audiobook from Audible.com just for trying out a 30-day trial with Audible. And your chance to win four audiobooks of your choice during our August Contest. Hey, free is great. Enter today for your chance to win. If you don't enter, you can't win. And we're back. And as I promised earlier, we are with Felicia Sparks. She is the 2017 APA Audiobook Blogger of the Year. And I've been looking forward to having her on the show for a while now. Felicia, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm excited. And I'm excited to have you here. So, of course... You don't become the audiobook blogger of the year without being a fan of audiobooks. At least I don't think that's uh, something that would be easy for a person to do anyway. So let's start with the most important thing. Let's talk about audiobooks. Uh, I was looking at a blog post that you wrote, and it looks like you 
Uh, reference uh, Pete Dragon and the Hardy Boys is some of the earliest things that got you into audiobooks. So tell us a little bit about when and how you uh, were introduced to the world of audiobooks. Well, um, I was a kid in the 70s, and so we used to have these little record players that we could put in our um, put in our brooms because this was way before, you know, most things. And these weren't fancy, and my first – um, records were actually stories. They were the Hardy Boys, the Nancy Drews, the Monkees used to do this um, little storytelling thing. And then I still have my Pete's Dragon long play record and my um, Hobbit long play record. And so I guess you could say I've been an audiobook fan for a long, long time. Um, but if you're talking about audiobooks as we know them now, uh, my dad was in construction. And we moved a lot when I was a kid. I grew up in a small little town in West Texas, but he was in the oil business. So we moved around like I would spend part of my school year in our normal town. But then we would move to fascinating places like Hobbs, New Mexico or Enid, Oklahoma or something like that. And we would do these road trips and my dad would rent cassette tapes from truck stops and we would listen to stories. That's when I actually learned the difference between abridged and unabridged. My dad was vehemently opposed to abridged audiobooks, go dad. And I have just been in love with audiobooks since then. So it, it's been a long love affair for me with audiobooks. There was a period in the um, 1990s where I didn't listen to audiobooks because libraries didn't um, carry a lot of audiobooks back then, and I was a broke 20 something, and libraries were where I got most of my stories. So I did a lot of book reading during that time, but I was really excited when libraries started getting back on the audiobook train. It was about the time CDs became a big thing and it was easier to carry, but that's how long I've been listening to audiobooks. So a long, long time. So your story, uh, shares some common elements with my own in that regard. Of course, mine being born more of necessity than uh, anything else. But I also remember listening to uh, cassette tapes in, in the, in the 80s. I was born in 81. So uh, I remember listening to a lot of uh, books on cassette back in the day. Um, not not necessarily the ones that your dad was uh, finding at the truck stop. So it's nice to know that someone uh, has been a fan so long that they can remember the audiobooks on the cassette tape era. And uh, also, go your dad, I agree. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine listening to an abridged audiobook yeah, he, anymore. Yeah, he taught me a long time ago that if you're going to cheat the story, just don't listen to it. He would have killed me had I ever read a Cliff Notes version of anything, and that's what he equated um, abridged audiobooks to. So, what are the types of things if someone hasn't checked out your blog and it's geekybloggersbookblog.com? Uh, if someone hasn't checked it out, what are the types of things that you uh, like to review on your blog, and what are your favorite genres and some of uh, your your favorite listens through the past few years? I am a big romance, urban fantasy, uh, occasional mystery thrillers. I like cozy mysteries. Those are the main ones that I review on my blog. And I guess if you want to go off of just kind of what I listened to last week, because last week was a really good listening week for me, I listened to Iona Andrews, which is a great urban fantasy writer duo, husband and wife, and Renee Rodman does their audiobook. And, and before anybody asks, yes, she does all of their audiobooks, no matter what series it is. So um, that's a great one. Jennifer Estep's Elemental Assassin series with Lauren Portgang. Um, Kristen Ashley's Fantasyland series with Tilly Hooper. Uh, there, I could go on and on. Mystery thrillers. Um, I really like particular authors. It's so funny. Mystery thrillers, I kind of find through the narrator as opposed to the author. I have gone to mystery thriller conventions, but I became a fan of them through following a narrator down that path. So 
I highly recommend Ray Porter, Hillary Hoover. Um, there's just a lot that is, it's so great out there. So many choices. And, but those are my favorites. I mean, these are ones that I could listen to over and over again. I always, you know, think of it like I feel like we're living in the golden age of audiobooks, particularly when it comes to uh, the fact that they're so accessible now digitally, but also just in terms of how many talented narrators there are and how many books that are coming out. And, uh, you know, the fact that sales have gone up every year for the past several and uh, that more and more titles are coming out, it just seems like it's a really good time to be a fan. Yes, it is. And honestly, since I have been listening so long, I can tell you the quality of how we hear the stories now is tenfold to what it used to be. It's not that you used to couldn't get good narrators. I mean, I listened to Davina Porter do um, Outlander a long time ago, and she still is one of the top at what she does. But those were few and far between. You used to just get told a story. I mean, it was just reading the story. And now it is like not a theatrical production, though I guess some do go that way. But most of it is you're getting enveloped in the story now. They're making an effort to bring these characters alive without overpowering the story. And it's tricky, but it's getting, they do it so well. The narrators that are good at their job really do it well. It's interesting because I've talked about this on the show before, but I'm always happy to revisit the topic. If you look at the history of audiobooks and how they really came to be, they existed for people who were blind or visually impaired quite a, for quite a while before they hit the commercial market. And one of the um, things that early audiobook listeners would sometimes tell uh, the publishers, and this is back when it was just for the visually impaired uh, market, they would say, don't have the narrator act out the story. I want to be able to interpret the story for myself. And if they're acting it, that's not allowing me to use my imagination, but you can't um, really get away with that in the commercial market today. And it's one thing that I never personally agreed with, but that was certainly a prevailing opinion. And it's still out there to some extent uh, as far as how um, these books should be handled. But I definitely agree that uh, there are more, uh, you know, like you said, they're not exactly theatrical performance now, but they are more theatrical than they used to be. Yeah, and I think um, for those that don't want it, they can use text-to-speech. I mean, that has now come a long enough way that I know plenty of people that do that will set their books down, you know, like on a um, tablet of some sort and switch on text-to-speech and listen to that. That would drive me nuts, but I know people do it. <laughs> oh, I, I have done it, of course, being visually impaired. I use text-to-speech every so often if the book isn't available as an audiobook, but my problem with it is there's no inflection and it just it just doesn't work for me. I need to feel like I'm being talked to and hearing the voices sound more human than they used to trust me, but they they aren't there because they don't have inflection and uh, pauses or you know any sort of emotional heft to them. That's why I tend to avoid text-to-speech, even though for me as someone with a visual impairment, they do make a, a lot more books accessible that way. Yeah, it, it's something that I have family members that use, and I'm very glad it exists. I'm glad it's gotten a lot better. Um, yeah, and so I tell people, if you just want a book read to you, I mean like monotone nothing, try it. You might like it. I don't know. So you talked a little bit earlier about how you got into mysteries and thrillers sort of by narrator. And that's interesting because I always wonder how people pick out, you know, the books that they're going to read or listen to in the case of audiobooks. And, uh, you know, sometimes they'll scan the favorite genres and sometimes they'll 
keep track of their favorite authors when they have a, a new book out. But it's unique to audiobooks, obviously, that sometimes you check the narrator listings and see what your favorite narrators are going to be working on next. How much of your decisions on what books to listen to fit into those categories, genre, or it's an author you like, or a narrator you like? Um, actually, all three. I... Uh... I have started following narrators down what I would call the narrator listening hole. Like if I find one that I really, really like and um, Ray Porter is a good example. He um, narrates a series by Jonathan Mayberry that is an excellent series. It's the Joe Ledger series. But I took it from there and listened to him do some other books that may not have appealed to me just on um, – just on, I would have never looked at them because of maybe the title, but I looked at different books, and so I found some more fantasy, uh, urban fantasy, some thrillers through him. Now, I can't say that I've jumped so far out of my genre comfort zone to follow somebody. I've always listened to mystery thrillers and um, romance and urban fantasy, but I'm willing to take a chance on an author I may not know. And or a book that doesn't seem like it would be in my wheelhouse. And in an odd turn of events, there have been a couple of authors that have now landed on my must get list that would have never been there had it not been for the narrator. So it's it's a great way to find new books is to take my favorite narrators and just do a search by their name. And to be honest, for me, it's it's easier because twice a year I, I focus on narrators on my blog. And when I'm doing it, I'm putting together a list of books they narrate. And I use that time to be like, oh, they narrated that. I'll pick that up. It's not good months on my pocketbooks those two months, but it's it's great for finding new stuff. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of Ray Porter as well. I think he's very versatile, and I've heard him narrate both um, – fiction and nonfiction and he obviously works in several different genres as well and yeah I, I am really big on that or if I listen to a narrator I get really excited when I find out they have a huge backlist I'm like yes when they're new to me according to you you actually started blogging around 2006 is that right yeah I had a personal blog from 2006 to 2008, and then in 2008, I switched over to book blogging for good, and then um, 2012 is when I switched over to mostly audiobooks. So I was curious a little bit about that transition. You've been listening uh, for a long time, but why uh, did it take from 28 to or 2008 to 2012 to get uh, into it being mostly audiobooks. Honestly, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, whatever, it, audiobooks were really expensive. And um, even though there was the Audible, I've been an Audible member since 2009, buying outside of what my Audible credits would give me um, was really just expensive. And libraries weren't carrying a whole lot of audiobooks. I mean, well, at least not in the genres I listen to. So sure, they had quite a few mystery thrillers, but they didn't have a whole lot of romance. And there wasn't actually a whole lot of romance available anyway. Um, so I, I probably back then was... 50-50 with books read versus books listened. And in 2012 was when I started noticing that I was about 75-25. And I'm still about that percent on books read versus books listened. It, it just was a natural progression for me. It doesn't mean I don't review books that I just read that I don't listen to. But most of my reviews on my blog are audiobook reviews. I would say probably 90% of them. Do you review most everything you listen to, or do you save some and say, I'm just listening to this just for me to sort of give yourself a little bit of a break? So I write down a something about every book I, I listen to, but I don't review them all on my blog. In fact, because of the way that social media has changed and the way uh, getting reviews about books 
have changed. I mean, like now you've got bookstagrammers, booktubes, and I'm going to say these wrong. I'm sorry. Um, you've got podcasts, you've got, you know, Goodreads and you've got blogging. I actually have a good portion that are on Goodreads that never make it to my blog. And I make sure to schedule them on my social media so that they blast out and go to my Twitter and Facebook and say, go read my, go read my review on Goodreads. But I also, a couple of years ago, probably two, three, started doing shorter reviews. I found that I was getting burnt out on reviews in general. I mean, I could only think of five different ways to say the same thing over and over and over again. Because uh, most books I read, I enjoy, but it's always because of generally one of four reasons. I either really like the character and or reasons. I really like the characters. I really like the story. Um, it was powerful. It was moving. It made me think, you know, I have written so many reviews since 2008 that it's like they all sound the same to me. Now, granted, they don't sound the same to everybody else because not everybody – Nobody else reads every single review I write, but it's. I decided that I would go to a shorter review format, and you know, honestly, that's perfect for good reads. I, I throw up a couple of reasons I really liked or didn't like a book, a couple of reasons why I liked or really didn't like a narrator, and I always separate those out. And I always tell people when you're reviewing, it's really helpful if you separate them out because. I can love a narrator and not like a book, and I can vice versa that, or I can say they make each other better or they make each other worse. That's that's a perfect format for me, and most of my reviews are just on Goodreads. They never make it to my blog. I only post two or three reviews a week on my blog. I only post content on my blog Monday through Friday, and honestly, Tuesday and Fridays are... Well, Tuesdays are the releases, audiobook releases, but Fridays is Fit Readers, which is just not book related at all. So it's like, oh yes, we're going to talk about Fit Readers here in a minute. <laughs> and so it's it's like I have three days that I can use for either discussion or reviews, and I do it for both, and then I take weekends off. So. You brought up quite a number of things that I would want to comment on. One of which is. I noticed on your website, and when I would write book reviews instead of doing a podcast, I had sort of this same stance where I would tell people that uh, my reviews are probably going to be more positive than they might otherwise be because I'm more apt to listen to things that I enjoy or that I think I will enjoy. And like you say on your website, sometimes I get let down, but I, I thought – that was a, a, a pretty good disclaimer to have there for everybody to see a little bit of transparency on your part to explain that, you know, they're, that I'm generally picking the reviews that are the books that I review. They're not being picked. Yeah. And um, back, back in the day when I was starting and um, I'm lucky I started when I did, there wasn't a big book blogger group. So it, it was, I didn't work with a lot of plush, Publishers, in fact, I didn't even know anything about that when I started. I've always just picked my books. There was a segment in there where I was reading everything people threw in front of me, and I had a lot more negative reviews then because that was not books I would choose. But I, I'm i honest about what I like and what I don't like. I, I kind of feel you, <laughs> you can't trust what I like if you don't know what I don't like. But... Even my favorite authors have written books that I've read that I didn't like. And I'm not going to throw up some, yeah, this was okay, if I didn't feel it was. I'm never mean about it, but my re my blog is not all five-star reviews. In fact, I very rarely give five stars, so it's, it's not all four-star reviews or three stars, which I think are good. Three stars are good. They're just not rereads in my category, but... Occasionally, there's a two or one on there because that's just how I felt about that book. But I'm also really honest that I'm a mood reader. So if something hits me as it doesn't fit my mood at the time, that might also be the cause. Because I think reading is so personal. 
Like, we all bring in our own life experience. So a book may bug the heck out of me because of my own personal life experience, but it won't bug somebody else for the same exact reason. Oh, I would absolutely agree with that as well. I have to be be very mindful of my own mood when I'm trying to decide whether or not I really enjoyed a book. And uh, sometimes uh, I don't because I'm just in a pretty sour disposition at the time and it's not the fault of the author the story or the narrator it's just kind of one of those things so i tend to avoid mentioning books like that when i'm writing on goodreads or if i'm talking about them on the podcast because i don't think i can honestly give them a fair assessment until i'm in a better mood and go back to it but that does definitely happen from time to time and the other thing you said that was sort of interesting uh, when you were talking about your reviews is how you feel like, you know, you are writing the same reviews over and over again. And I recall having that problem myself, especially if I reviewed the s- same narrator a lot. And if their performance was pretty consistent throughout their narrations, it got a little hard to single out different aspects that you could talk about. Yeah, and then I then I had to remind myself that it was okay for me to say the same thing because somebody may not have read my review of that narrator before. So what I would say was still relevant. But that's hard to remember when you're the one who writes all the reviews. Yeah, and I sort of have the same philosophy on the podcast now that I do tend to say some things on multiple episodes because uh, our data tells me that we have new listeners all the time. and They don't always go back through the archives to find out what's been said before. So bringing it up again, if you're a loyal listener and have been here every week, thank you. But if you're new, uh, you're still going to feel like you haven't necessarily missed it. Yeah, and I think that's something – The longer people get into reviewing and stuff, they have to remind themselves. I wish somebody would have taught me that when I started because I used to get panic attacks when I couldn't come up with something new to say about something. And somebody um, I was talking to because I go to a lot of conventions said, oh, I read your review on this. And I said, you didn't feel like it was a repeat of what I said about this. And they're like, I never read that review. And I'm like. Oh, that was kind of my light bulb moment. I'm like, dang, just because I read them all does not mean everybody else reads them all. So it's not repeat in their world. What would you say if someone came to you and, you know, you might have many things to say in this example, but what are some of the things that you would say if someone came to you and said, I'm thinking of starting a audiobook blog, what are the things that I should do? What shouldn't I do? What are the things that I should know? What are the things you wish someone had told you? Uh, Different things like that. What advice would you give to someone if they said, hey, Felicia, you're the 2017 audiobook blogger of the year. I kind of want to start my own blog. What should I I do. What would you tell me? I actually have an elevator pitch for this because I have been asked this a couple of times over the years. And my first one would be make sure that you love books. Um, Don't just do it because this seems like a good segment of the blogging community to get in or whatever. And it is a great segment. Don't get me wrong. The book blogging community is amazing. But one, make sure you love books. Two, decide on your platform. You don't necessarily have to have a blog these days. You can do an Instagrammer. You can do YouTube. You can do podcasts. You can do strictly Goodreads. Um, Blogging is also very, very fun, but that's that's work on its own. Just like podcast has its own work, Instagramming its own work, that kind of thing. Get comfortable with social media because in order to get the word out, you're going to have to be on more than one platform. You're going to need to, I always say, pick your main platform and then pick two more to go with it. So for like me, it's my blog and um, Twitter and Facebook. Though I do use Instagram, it's mostly personal. Be prepared to review what you've already read. And that is the perfect place to start. We've all read books before we got into this. Even me, way back in the day, 
I started just reviewing books that I had already read, books I got from the library. Um, and, you know, don't take things personally. If you get rejected for reviews, like if you send out a, I'd really like this book to review, whether it's in audiobooks or book books, and I hate that I said that because they are books no matter what, but <laughs> don't, don't get upset if you hear no from a publisher. There are publishers I hear no from all the time and that is fine. It's not personal. It is based on how many review copies they have, whether or not they're giving out review copies, they may not. And a lot of this is give yourself a break. I, I wish somebody would have told that I have, I almost quit a couple of years ago um, because it is – it seems like a lot of work if you make it a lot of work. It, I'm not going to say it's not a lot of work. It is. But a lot of that pressure is internal. If you have sponsors, then, yes, you have to live up to a service level agreement with them, whatever that is. Like if they're – um, advertising on your page, you need to meet whatever you said you were going to meet with them. Um, I don't do any of that, so I don't have any of those pressures. But <laughs> outside of that, if this is just a hobby for you and you want to make content that is seen and everything, there is a little pressure, but mostly have fun with it because you're going to build an audience more through that than forcing yourself to do it. And let yourself have time off. I, I, I know that sounds counterproductive, but just like I take weekends off, this year I brought on a book club friend of mine, and she um, writes reviews. So, like, I took July off. I actually – there's not a review from me in July. It's, it's one of those things where you need to realize you have a life, and, and that life – balance needs to be there. The more fun you have with it, the bigger your audience will grow. If you're stress writing, people know that. So those are my biggest key elements. And you actually covered a couple different things that I was going to bring up, and one of which is the fact that you did take uh, July off. And I think people don't always appreciate the fact that when you're a listener to an to audiobooks, and we've discussed it on the show before, You sometimes you fall into a listening slump. They happen. And sometimes when you're a blogger, you fall into a blogging slump where you don't want to feel uh, like writing anything. And sometimes when you're a listener who blogs, you fall into a slump that covers both of those categories. And that's where problems yeah, sort of I, start. Yeah, I hit that last year. I normally read 150 to 200 books. Last year I read, I think it ended up being 98, which is way low for me. And I think 70 of those happened before July. But between July and December, I only read 20 books. I, I just was not... I, I just couldn't do it. And um, it's important to give yourself a break and say it's okay. Because if you try to force read something, it, it's never going to work out well for you or the book. Yeah, exactly. One of the advice that I gave on this podcast, for those who haven't heard it, a few weeks ago did an episode on slumps. And one of the things I said is if you are in one, you could just try to ride it out for as long as it takes. And and just accept that you're in one and, and wait for it to pass. They eventually do pass. Yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And, of course, you talked about the fact that you almost quit. And that was interesting to me because I read that. And we're going to, in the show notes for people listening, I'm going to have a link to the, the website where you can check out all of our content. But I'm also going to link to some specific posts that you might find interesting about uh, her time in New York, and one of them uh, that you call a blog confession, you sort of talked about the fact that you almost weren't the 2017 audiobook blogger of the year because you almost quit. And what were the circumstances? I think you sort of touched on a couple of them, but were, what were the circumstances? You said you were like two days away from quitting, and what 
brought you to that point and then what sort of walked you back away from the lead? So um, it was the first time since I had been blogging that I had ever been in a slump as bad as what I was in last year at the end of the year. And I was still coming up with content um, mostly because like November is 30 days of thanks. That's really e- that's not an easy month for me to put together, but it's a really easy month for me to get away with not reading because it's more about what I've read in the last year um, or what I've listened to. I just really was like, is this something I still have joy doing? Am I in this slump because I feel like blogs are no longer relevant. I mean, this was a big discussion in the blogging world last year. You know, um, there was a lot more um, relevance put on to bookstagrammers. I'm still saying that wrong. I know I am. And um, booktubers and blogs were becoming, I won't say less relevant, but in our eyes, it appeared that publishers were liking other forms of social media outpour. And I don't know if this is true or not. So, but I mean, when it hit, when you're in that mood already, and then you get a bill of how much your web hosting is going to cost for, you know, that my web hosting was coming up in November. Um, I really had to sit down and go, do I want to pay that money for, you know, something that I am not necessarily right now filling (laughs) for lack of a better word. And um, what made me change my mind was I talked to a few friends of mine, some of which had given up their blogs and some that are giving up their blogs this year. And I asked what made them make that decision to just say, I'm done. How much did you miss it? You know, and some of them don't and some of them do, but they were like, what? The question you have to ask yourself is, are you okay with doing that and just, you know, cutting the cord, so to speak? And I really wasn't. I felt I still had a lot to add to the conversation. And that's really when I started doing more confession posts and when I started really looking at how I review and how I blog differently, I took a whole other approach to it in the fact that I kind of want to help people find um, their reads or their narrators, but I don't necessarily need to do that through telling them what books are good or bad, but maybe teaching them how to listen to audiobooks. So last year I did a lot of posts on how to listen to them through your library and um how to test narrators and, you know, I started doing, I started putting narrators into my 30 days of thanks actually a couple of years before. But to me, these are all still relevant things. Um, now my reviews are kind of second to me. I, um, I put them up and whatever, but it's, it's not the important part of my blog. It's the important part of my blog is if I'm connecting readers to books and I'm a big library supporter so I still wanted an avenue to get the word out about libraries so it it just kind of I had to sit down and ask myself if I was still relevant in the conversation and I felt like I might be and then I got told I was so that was just kind of one of those things I I was feeling irrelevant and I kind of had to see if I still had something left to add and I decided I did and then the APA decided I really was relevant and I was like wow that's that's weird it happened all at once (laughs) and we're going to talk about that in just a moment but before we get there I wanted to ask you about a section of your website that we have talked about briefly but tell the listeners who may not have seen it or haven't checked out your website before now, tell them a little bit about Fit Readers. Oh, Fit Readers. Um, this started four years ago, and we started as book blog walkers, um, but we felt that was too um, confining. Like, everybody was asking, oh, I can't do it because I'm not a blogger. And 
So we switched the name to Fit Readers, and Fit Readers is just a weekly check-in. We have a Facebook group. We use a tag on Twitter of really people just trying to be fit in their own way. Everybody's on different levels. We have people who run marathons who are working on doing crazy running things that I'm like, whoa, no, what? Yeah, go you, not me. Um and then we have moderate people like who do who aim for that ten to fifteen thousand steps a day. Um, personally, I'm only on an eight thousand step goal for six days a week. So everybody comes in at their different levels. We have some people just starting out where the only thing they want to do is add a couple of hours of activity into their life a a week. And we are totally supportive, non-judgmental. We don't care where you are in your fit thing. We just want everybody to be around for a while. So we totally support each other. Um, it's males, females. You can, the only thing that really kind of ties us together is that we're all readers, but we have authors, we have casual readers and by casual readers I mean some people who only read two books a year all over the place but it really is just one of those things where we support whatever you're trying to do we I monitor the Facebook group so that I make sure that nothing comes up that it seems judgmental like I'm doing this eating thing and if you're not because we've had people join the group that have only been in there to push their agenda and I have kicked them out it's it's one of those things where I want everybody to feel comfortable because fitness is such a personal thing and it's everybody's got different life I don't know what do you call them life things that weigh on you and you you can only do what you can do but if you feel like nobody's supporting you you won't even do that and so we want to make sure everybody does what they can to make their lives better so that's kind of what Fit Readers is, and it's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and it's interesting that you said it that way because uh, it's a cross-section of two things that are both very personal to people. Uh, fitness and reading both uh, have – both of those things cover a wide array of options, and people who uh, fit into those two categories, people that want to be fit and people who read – uh, tend to cater their uh, routines for their own personal tastes a lot. So there's definitely a good reason, I would say, that the two came together. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I go to a lot of conventions, and so I meet a lot of readers in person, and we all have different looks. We all have different statuses where we are in the fit thing. And, you know, reading is such a solid Solid, solid, sol solitary. There's the word I'm looking for. It's such a solitary activity, and sometimes it can be a very sit on your butt activity, which is why I always promote audiobooks because I'm like, you don't necessarily have to sit on your butt while you're listening to an audiobook. You know, it can lead to um, things that just you you feel like, oh, I'm this far away from where I want to be in fitness. I'm not even going to start. And I think that's dangerous. So we say come in where you are. If you can only walk 100 steps a day, but you were doing zero, then we're good for it. I mean, that's that's an extreme example. But, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter where you are. So I would encourage you, if you think that sounds interesting to you, uh, you can learn more about it by uh, checking out Geeky Book Bloggers. No, Geeky Bloggers Book <laughs> Blog. I told you I was going to mess this up. I just, I just laughed. How did you come up with that as your name? Because I am going to tell you all to go to geekybloggersbookblog.com and bookmark it because if you uh, type it into your web browser more than once, you're going to get carpal tunnel. So how did you come up with that name? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, as I mentioned before, I started blogging way back when, and there weren't a whole lot of do this, don't do that kind of rules out there then. There was a lot of 
you know, here it is. Um, just kind of go, just pick a name that's relevant. And I am, so my other nickname is the history chick, but I felt that was too restrictive because I didn't read just history of any, like I didn't read only historical romance or only this. So I was like, well, I'm a geek by trade. I do that for a living and I game. I'm a gamer. So I'm like, okay, well, I will do that. I will go with Geeky Blogger because the other thing I did was get out there and do different um, Google searches for the word geek and a lot of names were taken and I was like, oh, I'll be the Geeky Blogger. Why I didn't just go with the Geeky Blogger? Instead of having to put in book blog, I don't know, but I felt I needed to be specific about what I was doing. And now I have the longest URL in the URL history. Okay, it's probably not the longest, but it feels like that if you're typing it in. So it's the reason I haven't gotten business cards redone is because I refuse to type that all in again. So it's it's just that's how I came up with it. Nowadays, I would tell people, come up with something you find relevant and find a way to shorten it for your URL. You can call yourself whatever you want name-wise. Just your URL makes shorter. <laughs> Yours is only a few letters longer than mine at randomcatastrophe.net, so I probably shouldn't be talking too much, but it's just one of those things where it's all those B words become a tongue twister when you feel like you have to say them, and so that's why I don't narrate audiobooks. (laughs) Let the audiobook narrators do the book promos for your website. Yeah, exactly. Because they can say it. So you're the 2017 APA Blogger of the Year, and we're going to talk about how you uh, found out about that. You were actually the runner-up the year before, that is that is right? That is correct. I was the runner-up um, in 2016. So persistence pays off, people, I'm telling <laughs> you. Tell us what you can, and I don't know how much you can tell us, but tell us what you can about when you found out and what the process was to becoming uh, how you got – chosen as the audiobook blogger of the year? Oh, actually, I can I can pretty much, I haven't been told I can't say anything. So, um, so basically, um, the APA, this was the third year. The first year, Jennifer won. Last year, Beth won. I won this year. So basically, the APA put out a notice asking you to submit for audiobook blogger of the year. Um, Basically, they ask, and I mean, they may change this format in the future, so please don't hold it to exactly this, but they ask you to put who you are, you know, a little bit about your blog. They ask you to link, I can't remember if it was three or five posts that you thought were relevant. They generally have some rules about the kind of posts they want to see. I'm just going to throw this out that I did not read that closely enough and I did not submit one type of post they wanted, but luckily my other posts were good. Then, you know, they basically go through this thing and you don't hear anything for a while. And having one runner up last year, uh, I kind of knew, well, let me rephrase. I found out I won runner up last year when I started getting bombarded on Twitter They sent out the release, and that's how I found out I was runner-up. This year, for winning, I found out about a week before everybody else did, and I had to be quiet. I will say this. Do not panic if the main person doing the judging is someone you haven't reviewed, because there's always a narrator on the panel, and then there's some other judges. This year, it was Scott Brick. Well, I've actually only listened at that time, had only listened to one Scott Brick title. And my review was very middle of the road. Not that I didn't think he did an excellent job, but it it wasn't until the end of the book that I understood why he narrated it the way he did. And I'm very honest in my reviews in the aspect that I will say, you know, at first I thought this guy was pretty monotone. I understood at the end why he was or however they choose to approach the particular thing, it has to do with the character. But you don't always necessarily get that right off the bat. So he was the narrator choice, and I got a good chance to talk to him when I was in New York to ask what particularly it was about my blog that 
made me relevant. And part of it is your social media. You know, do you get out there? Do you really love audiobooks as what they're looking for first? And then the second thing is it really was my discussions on how to listen to audiobooks, how to incorporate them into your life, how to just my how to's, um, including them in libraries, where to find them, how to, you know, I, I've covered several of those topics. And third was my willingness to work with people in the audiobook community. That doesn't necessarily mean narrators directly. Part of it is how you, how you promote the stuff you've done. And I would say still a good portion of what I listen to comes from the library or something I bought myself. I am not on every review list. And because I am a mood reader, I sometimes do not request things to review because I don't know if I'm going to be in the mood to read them. You know, I, I'm a big proponent of where else to get audiobooks. And so it was all of that. And I found out a week before everybody else did. And I'm glad I had that week because I was actually really, I'm pretty sure that came across in my post, but I was floored that I won. With the crisis that I went through last year about blogging, it it was just really, it was great. It was fantastic. And yes, I felt a bit like a fraud. But I'm glad that my love of audiobooks still shone through, even when I was going through a personal, am I good enough to continue doing this crisis? So so the announcement is made, you won, and then you uh, ended up going to New York. But what all happened between there? And before you tell us that, I'll remind listeners again that I'm going to link to specific posts that you wrote on your uh, time in New York, including the ones with the photos. Yeah. So tell us everything that happened that you want to share with us about okay. after you after won. After I won, I and I want to make this really clear, you do not have to go to New York. So do not feel like you cannot submit for this if you can't afford the trip to New York, because that's all on you. You, you have to pay for your own trip. What you get as the winner of the APA Blogger of the Year Award is two tickets to their ceremony, which, by the way, is worth a lot of money. You get a gift card for um, your win. But I, I want to repeat that if you cannot afford to go to the thing, do not feel like you can't submit because I think some people don't submit because of that. You should submit whether you can afford to go or not. I actually was really lucky. I had enough hotel points. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there. So I went, and it is an experience of a lifetime. It was it was great. What are you obligated to? I, I got asked this the other day, what I was obligated to do. And the truth is, nothing. I, I have no obligations for winning other than, you know, personal obligations, which is I feel the need to be even more vocal about audiobooks, but that's all on me. There are no strings attached to this particular honor. You, you are just honored for the work that you have done. That, that's kind of what it was, but I went to New York. I'm glad I did. I think it's an experience anybody should do. I will also say this, even if you're not the APA blogger of the year, and I found this out because I went to BEA last year, go to the audiobook events that happen, the naughties that happen during the award show. That's where most people who are not nominated or just fans will meet at a bar and um, get together and talk um, to each other and watch the live stream and um, then everybody from the audience goes and visit goes and joins them. There's generally because the audiobook conference happens at the same time, there's generally happy hours every night after their um, conference. So you can go join um, the narrators there and get a chance to talk to them. So if you are a blogger, this is a good chance to also network. But th- that it was a, an experience of a lifetime. I think I, I sufficiently cried a lot. It was also warm in New York, so I'm going to say that I didn't cry all the time. Some of it was just sweat. I was nervous as heck. I hope that didn't show too much, but 
I was really nervous. I mean, like, there are these people who are so used to this kind of life. And I am, like, sitting in, we went to a pre-party before <laughs> the Audis, and I'm sitting in a really fancy little flat. Is that what they call them in New York? And um, it's this many floors up, and you had to go past a doorman, and I'm like, oh, this is so not my life, and this is so very cool, but I am so very nervous that I'm just going to be an idiot. But actually, every narrator I met was so sweet and so kind, and they really appreciate what we do. I can't even repeat that enough. They appreciate us. They, every single one of them, even the ones I fangirled over, which, I mean, I'm pretty much sure that January Lavoy is like, I'm going to you know, stay five feet from her next time. No, that's not true. January is really cool. She sent me an email saying that she was really happy to hear that I was, I was that thrilled to meet her, but everybody is so nice. And I guess it was a good reminder that they're just people too. It was excellent. But some other things come with that is that you start getting asked to talk at conferences and that kind of thing. And those are really cool to do if you can. And uh, you actually mentioned on your website, uh, having done a panel not that long ago, is yeah. that right? Uh, your your audio resource uh, section talks a lot about, and it's some of, a lot of some of the th- things that you talked about on the show or some of the things that you covered in that. But I would definitely recommend people check out that area of your website as well because if you're going to type it into your browser you might as well stay a while right (laughs) yeah and i mean and that i put in a separate thing at the top of the page because we did go over and those resources are not even though that particular panel we were talking to authors i feel that a lot of that information is pertinent to um bloggers too i mean you know it's about the importance of learning who the audiobook community and i will admit that this was a panel at RT, which is Romantic Times. So a lot of the blogs that we mentioned were romance bloggers, but you can generally get out there and find bloggers that blog about the same kind of books you listen to, but the audiobook community in general is very, very supportive of each other. Beth and I, Jennifer and I, we don't read the same things. We don't listen to the same things, but we've all been friends for a long time. It's because we do have that one thing connecting us. We love audiobooks. And so you will find that there is no, I say this, but I, I firmly believe this is the most welcoming community within the book book blogging community that there is. I believe audiobook bloggers and readers and listeners are just amazingly um, kind to each other. I will echo those sentiments, and I will say that it is a very supportive community. I remember, you know, at the beginning of this podcast, when I uh, agreed to take over as host, thinking, what am I going to be talking about 10, 12 weeks from now? But you know, people will ask me if they can come on this podcast. And I'm talking about people that have narrated a lot of different titles and stuff have said, hey, I'd love to come on sometime and different things like that. And, Isn't that cool? You know, the, That's just like the cool it, it is. It is so cool, and it makes it a lot easier to find guests when they will approach you. But, um, you know, everybody's been super cool, and I've gotten into sort of some of the – Uh, Facebook audiobook fan groups and things like that and met a lot of people through there and everybody's been very supportive of the work that I'm doing and I can vouch for the fact that you know they like the blogs and and everything like that and it's just such a such a great community to be involved in so if you're just listening to this podcast now and are debating about whether or not you should be more active in the audiobook world and and things like that, I would say the answer to that is yes, because you will meet some very cool people along the way. Yes, you will. I will definitely second that. And you don't even have to be a blogger. You can be a pure listener. And you, there are Facebook groups and on Twitter. And it really seriously encompassing. Um, most narrators are pretty easy to approach and talk to. So um, I would just say go for it. I guess I can't get you off the 
air without first asking you about uh, your rescue animal. Yes, yeah, so I'm a big um, dog rescue, dog transport for rescues. I'm definitely a dog don't shop. Um, and this applies to cats too, even though I don't have a cat. I, I've been in the rescue, um, into rescue one way or another um, for 10 years, 12 years, a long time. Um, I firmly love I love animals. I foster. Um, right now I'm not fostering because I actually foster filled my last dog. I've had plenty of fosters that I did not. They call it foster fill. It's just she decided she was staying here. She wasn't going anywhere else. Three dogs is kind of my limit for having permanent guests. But I um, do transports with helping hounds and a few other things where, you know, we get – because I tell people all the time, if you can't foster, donate. If you can't donate, um, then donate your time. You know, if you can't do that, share. Because um, there's posts all the time about rescues and trying to get dogs and cats out of shelters. And if you think about it, for every dog or cat or animal that we move out of shelters, it actually opens up a space for, well, for two, but if you think about if that rescue adopts out that animal, then they can take in another animal, and then they that opens up the shelter for another animal that doesn't get put to sleep. So it's um, it really is trifold, but there are other ways that you can get involved. You can transport. Like a lot of times rescues need transports even across town, or like helping hounds is one of those that take dogs from – like different areas in Texas and transports them up north. So they have, um, you, you have that you also, and you can just do a leg or something if it's just one or two dogs, but then you have things like the Liberty train, which is, um, about helping rescues get dogs from certain parts of the country into other parts of the country. And they, they set up our long, um, our long legs. So that, I've done that quite a few times where you just sign up for the leg that's around your area. And so you are really helping a dog. You and 20 other people are helping a dog get from the last one I did, came from South Texas and went up to New York City. So um, it's it's really amazing how just taking a couple of hours out of your life can change not only the dog's life because you are the dog or cat's life because you are saving them. But also yours, you just you just feel eternally grateful after that, you know, that you did something and you saved a life. Absolutely, and I think that's a tremendous thing to do. And I should know your your dogs are uh, they have character names? Yes, they they're all from books. So, um, so my um, I have Cinder from the Marissa Meyer, well, Cinder Scarlet. Um, but she's also a red-headed dog, so and my last name is Sparks, so it also was kind of funny there. And then there is Minerva, of course, from Minerva McConaughey. Of course, had I known what a troublemaker she was, she might have gotten a different um, a different character's name from Harry Potter. But she's Minerva, and then I have Lizzie from Pride and Prejudice. So well, that all sounds absolutely fantastic. Uh, again, I want to encourage everybody to check out geekybloggersbookblog.com and bookmark it so that you don't hurt your hand typing it a second time. Uh, reviews, there's uh, – her her release post is called In My Ear, which I did not know before I decided to do Caught My Ear every week. <laughs> You know, it's for the lawyers to to decide. What oh no, no, no! no. I think I think <laughs> I'm teasing, but you yeah. know. Well, and I think, um, like in my ear, I actually found out has been a long time music thing. But I reached out to the person that I think started that, and they're like, "Yeah, I don't care," and I'm like, "Okay." So it's like one of those things, you know. I I really honestly think it'd be hard to come up with a unique name at this point for any weekly post. 
And, of course, you also have narrator profiles every so often. You did them in June for Audiobook Month, and I think you said earlier you do them at other times of the year as well. And I think those are a good thing to check out. They help you get to know narrators a little bit better, and those are some of the posts that I have enjoyed reading quite a bit myself. So is there anything else you would like to say before we let you go today? Um, not really, other than I really um, love that the audiobook community is growing by leaps and bounds. So if you're new to audiobooks, do not feel intimidated to reach out to anybody who's been listening to them for a while. Trust me, anybody who truly loves audiobooks will talk your ear off about them. So we, we totally love love, love, love people talking to us about audiobooks. So if you're a new blogger or a new good readers or book to grammar or whatever, feel free to reach out and say, hey, I'm starting this, you know, just kind of wanted to let you know. And also, you know, look around. If you need some hints on where some Facebook groups are, I'm sure any of us could tell you, depending on your genre, where are the best ones to hook up and see some of your favorites because narrators stop by those groups all the time absolutely and to that end we've already plugged your blog but would you uh mind plugging where else people can find you on the web if they want to say hi Hi. okay i um actually the easiest way to find me is probably typing in the geeky blogger um that's going to bring up most of my stuff i am on twitter i am on facebook i am on instagram I have a SoundCloud, but most of that's just me sharing other people's SoundCloud stuff. Uh, you can find me on any of those. Reach out, say hi. Um, you know, feel free to comment. I definitely try to answer everything back as fast as I can. I hope that y'all just really enjoy audiobooks. Always send me who you're listening to because I'm always interested to see who people are listening to. And thank you very much for coming on. We'll have to do this again in the future. And I've not been disappointed by this conversation at all. Like I said, you were one of the first people I wanted to talk to when I uh, became the host. And uh, you did a great job uh, on stage at the Audis and uh, everything else. And again, check out geekybloggersbookblog.com. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. It is time for our weekly Caught My Ear segment where I tell you about some audiobooks that have caught my ear. Usually they are audiobooks that come out the same week that you hear the podcast that got my attention. However, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. We're actually going to feature a narrator. And we're going to talk about some of this narrator's audiobook catalog and the narrator I have chosen is Ray Porter because as you have heard in the interview with Felicia we talked about Ray and a lot of the great work that he has done the first book that we are going to talk about here that was narrated by Ray Porter is one we specifically uh, touched on in the interview briefly it is titled Patient Zero, and it is the first novel in Jonathan Mayberry's Joe Ledger series, and we're going to hear a sample of that right now, narrated by one of the best, in my opinion, Ray Porter. So here is an excerpt from Patient Zero. Blackstone Audio presents... Patient Zero by Jonathan Mayberry 
This book is dedicated to the often unsung and overlooked heroes who work in covert operations and the intelligence communities. Part 1 Walkers A hero is no braver than an ordinary man, but he is braver five minutes longer. Ralph Waldo Emerson Chapter 1 when you have to kill the same terrorist twice in one week, then there's either something wrong with your skills or something wrong with your world. And there's nothing wrong with my skills. Our next Ray Porter title to catch my ear this week is a favorite of mine. It is titled SEAL Team 6, Memoirs of an Elite Navy SEAL Sniper. It is written by Howard E. Wasden and Stephen Templin, and, of course, narrated by Ray Porter again. Uh, this one is one that I listened to a few years ago, and I liked it because I thought that uh, Ray sounded very convincing, sounded like a badass, to be uh, perfectly honest. I don't know that I can think of another way to put it. He just sounded like a badass when he was reading uh, this book, and uh, it fits, given it's about uh, a Navy SEAL. So this one definitely was a favorite of mine from a couple years ago. And so here is an excerpt of SEAL Team 6, Memoirs of an Elite Navy SEAL Sniper by Howard E. Wasden and Stephen Temple. People use the term developing countries, but that is bullcrap. What developed in Somalia was things such as hunger and fighting. I think developing countries is just a term used to make the people who coined it feel better. No matter what you call them, starvation and war are two of the worst events imaginable. I calculated the exact distances to certain buildings. There are two primary considerations when making a sniper shot, windage and elevation. Because there was no significant wind that could throw my shot left or right, I didn't have to compensate for it. Elevation is the variable considered for range or distance to the target. Since most of my potential targets were between 200 yards, garage, and 650 yards, intersection beyond the target garage, I dialed my scope in at 500 yards. This way I could just hold my rifle higher or lower depending on range. When the shooting began, there would be no time to dial in range corrections on my scope between shots. We started our surveillance at 0600. While we waited for our agent to give us the signal, I played different scenarios over in my mind. One enemy popping out at one location, then another popping up at another location, and so on. I would acquire, aim, and even do a simulated trigger pull going through my rehearsed breathing and follow-through routine while picturing the actual engagement. Then I simulated reloading and getting back into my loopholed 10 power scope, continuing to scan for more booger eaters. I had done this dry firing and actual firing thousands of times, wet, dry, muddy, snowbound, from a dug-in hole in the ground, from an urban sniper hide through a partially open window, and nearly every which way imaginable. The words they had drilled into our heads since we began SEAL training were true. The more you sweat in peacetime, the less you bleed in war. This particular day I was charged with making sure none of my Delta Force buddies sprang a leak as I covered their insertion into the garage. My buddies' not bleeding in war was every bit as important as my not bleeding. Our target for this mission was Osman Ali Ato, Warlord ID's main financier, Although Casanova and I would have been able to recognize the target from our previous surveillance, we were required to have confirmation of his identity from the CIA asset before we gave the launch command. The irony wasn't lost on me that we were capturing Otto instead of killing him, despite the fact that he and his boss had killed hundreds of thousands of Somalis. I felt that if we could kill Otto and Ideed, we could stop the fighting, get the food to the people quickly, and go home in one piece. It wasn't until around 0815 that our asset finally gave the predetermined signal. 
He was doing this because the CIA paid him well. I had learned firsthand while working with the CIA how payoffs could sway loyalty. When we saw the signal, Casanova and I launched the full package. Little Bird and Black Hawk helicopters filled the sky. During this time, the Delta operators literally had their butts hanging out. The urban environment provided too much cover, too much concealment, and too many escape routes for the enemy. All a hostile had to do was shoot a few rounds at a Hilo or Humvee, jump back inside a building, and put his weapon down. Even if he reappeared, he was not considered hostile without a weapon. Things happened fast, and the environment was unforgiving. Delta Force operators fast-roped down inside the garage. Rangers fast-roped around the garage, and little birds flew overhead with Delta snipers, giving the assault force protection. Otto's people scattered like rats. Soon, enemy militia appeared in the neighborhood, shooting up at the helicopters. Normally, snipers operate in a spotter-sniper relationship. The spotter identifies, ranges the targets, and relays them to the sniper for execution. There would be no time for that on this op. We were engaged in urban warfare. In this environment, an enemy could appear from anywhere. Even worse, the enemy dressed the same as a civilian. We had to wait and see his intention. Even if he appeared with a gun, there was a chance he was part of a clan on our side. We had to wait until the person pointed the weapon in the direction of our guys. Then we would ensure the enemy ceased to exist. There would be no time for makeup or second shots. Both Casanova and I wielded 300 Win Mag sniper rifles. Through my loophole 10 power scope, I saw a militia man 500 yards away firing through an open window at the helos. I made a mental note to keep my heart rate down and centered the crosshairs on him as my muscle memory took over. Stocked firmly into the shoulder cheek position. The final book that I'm going to feature this week is one that ties in very well to our interview. If you recall, Felicia mentioned briefly that she's a gamer. And when I was younger and could see a lot better than I can now, I used to enjoy playing video games myself. And I always enjoyed playing Super Mario on the original Nintendo Entertainment System. So here we have Ray Porter again narrating a book titled Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America. The book is by Jeff Ryan. And this is one I listened to a couple years ago as well. And I think it was an Audible Daily Deal that I picked up, or it was on sale somehow. And I picked it up, and I listened, and it brought back a lot of fond memories of playing Super Mario. And so this is sort of a history of the game and the franchise and everything that it became for Nintendo. So our final excerpt today to tie it all together is Ray Porter uh, talking of video games in Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America. Distinct, memorable avatars for us to control. Sonic, Lara Croft, Mega Man. That trend has reversed. And popular games now feature silent, unknown characters, such as Halo's Master Chief and the faceless grunts from Call of Duty and SOCOM. Yet they're still copying Mario, who is both wackily specific, an overall plumber, and Vegas Fog. Anyone ever seen him unclog a drain? My own Mario memories probably aren't too different from anyone else's. My first experience was with the cardboard box the NES came in, rather than any game. A schoolmate brought it on the bus every day to show off, and we crowded around to look at the screenshots on its obverse side. A few months later, our parents bought us an NES, and my brothers and I put it through usage that would put a Miami air conditioner to shame. We traded games with neighbors, kids older and younger than us, even traded out of the middle school caste system with the cool kids. We started a neighborhood fan club. To get in, you had to beat a game and find a secret. Most everyone's secrets were from Super Mario Brothers, which had them in spades. Then high school and college and life happened, and I stopped gaming, save for a PC shooter once a year or so. I never chose to quit gaming. It just fell off my priorities list. 
Then, about 10 years ago, I landed a copy editing job at a dot-com. No one had any copy for me to proof before noon, yet I was coming in at 8.30 a.m. I asked my managing editor if there was anything I could write to help out. There was. She gave me a press release about a Pokemon tournament. The company had been using a freelancer for its irregular reporting of video game news and reviews. Having me write for this section of the site would bolster that coverage, and for free since I was salaried. I typed up the piece, handed it in, and a few minutes later heard my editor on the phone firing the freelancer. She said they had just hired a new video game expert. Gulp. In the months that followed, I studied video games in a way very few others have. I wasn't actually playing them since I was at work. I wasn't designing them either, so I didn't need to know alias coding or texture mapping. I needed to know why they were popular. What made one title better or cooler than the next? I made myself an expert in all things Sega, Sony, and Nintendo. And just about all things Nintendo, I found out, were connected to Mario. He was everywhere in sports games, fighting games, role-playing games, puzzle games, racing games, and every bit of branding imaginable. He had become a one-word shortcut for Nintendo, for gaming itself. And, I'm sure Nintendo hoped, for the concept of fun. Streets were named after him. There was even an unofficial holiday for him on March 10th. M-A-R-1-O. Get it? Super Mario has become the default nickname for any Mario. Formula One champion Mario Andretti, born in 1940, sometimes gets asked if he's named after Super Mario. He says he is, to the delight of the seven-year-olds who ask. Chef Mario Batali is called Super Mario as well. If you're good at a professional sport and your name is Mario, you know what your nickname will be. Just ask hockey's Mario Lemieux, football's Mario Williams, ultimate fighting's Mario Miranda, cycling's Mario Cipollini, and soccer's Mario Bassler, Mario Gomez, and Mario Balotelli. They are, respectively, Canadian, American, Brazilian, Italian, German, Spanish, and Ghanaese. The nickname cannot be avoided wherever on the globe you are a Mario. At some point I realized that the life story of Super Mario is the history of gaming itself. Yes, it's a history of Nintendo and its creators. Designer Shigeru Miyamoto, billionaire Hiroshi Yamauchi, and his underestimated son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa. But at its core, it's the biography of a man who's not real, but has a Q rating up there with Mickey Mouse, a figure whose specific tale of the tape, pudgy Italian plumber from Brooklyn, merely serves to make him as perpetual an underdog as that under-tall Italian boxer from Philadelphia, Rocky Balboa. A world-beloved character with roots across three continents— Asian invention, American setting, European name. A character almost totally blank, yet beloved. That is going to do it for this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. I want to thank our guest, Felicia Sparks, for coming on and giving... Uh, some of her time. I hope you all enjoyed the interview. I want to thank all of you for listening each and every week. If you're a new listener, welcome. We're happy to have you on board. Check out TalkingAudiobooks.com. You can browse our show archives and hear the past episodes and all that fun stuff. If you want to catch up, we will be back next week with a brand new episode of Talking Audiobooks where we will take another deep dive into the wonderful world of audiobooks. Until then, I am your host, Casey Trowbridge, and I'm going to encourage you to do what I encourage you to do every week at the end of this podcast, and keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. 
Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com. Follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio. Follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks. And subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors like Audible.com help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content. They don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you. And therefore, the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.